Welcome to Chapter 2 of our series, trying to answer the question, are we heading to a dystopian future? In this chapter, we will start our long journey by looking at the new utopia by Jerome K. Jerome. The new utopia is a short story written in 1891 by the English author and humorist Jerome Klapka Jerome. In the story, Jerome describes a dystopian socialist society based on the ideas espoused by British socialists of that era. Now, from all the dystopian future novels and films this series deals with, it might seem odd that I picked this relatively unknown short story. Other still will be the fact that instead of doing a deep dive analysis as you will find in other episodes, I'll read the whole bloody thing. Well, okay, that is not entirely accurate, as I took the liberty to rewrite and edit the story to make it slightly shorter and a little easier to read out loud. And let me explain why. First, as one can expect from Jerome K. Jerome, it's funny, although the edits I made probably made it a tad less so, but it's still fun to listen to. Second, it's a short story, so many of the characteristics of society are put plainly. But before going on to the story, I want to contextualize it. The New Utopia was written as the 19th century drew to a close. Marxist ideas began to take hold within British elite, especially academia and the gentry class, or what we would call today the upper middle class. I guess some things never change. Written over 130 years before I'm writing these lines, the New Utopia is the first known literary work depicting a dystopian future. It is, in fact, very likely that this short story is the precursor to the entire dystopian future genre. Indeed, as you will surely notice, this story shares many common themes with Aldous Huxley's Brave New World, George Orwell's 1984, and many more. The dreary world it is set in, the single uniformed conformity, the technologically advanced society, and the authoritarian means of governance employed by a totalitarian regime. However, given it was written in 1891, Aldous Huxley wouldn't be born for three more years and George Orwell would only grace the world with his presence a decade from then. In fact, the age of this story alone speaks to a point I mentioned in the intro, questioning the veracity of our fear of a coming dystopia. After all, this story proves that the fear of society's doom due to the latest socio-political craze is over 130 years old. And yet, we're still here afraid of the same thing. Importantly, given its age and that the subject matter is a socialist dystopia, you should remember the world Jerome K. Jerome lived in and the utopian dreams socialists of that time would describe. 1891 Britain was still deep in the age of warring empires. It was the pinnacle of Victorian England with the monarchy wielding considerable power and democracy still evolving. The working class in Britain was granted voting rights just 24 years before, and women will have to wait for that privilege for 27 years more. People worked in factories for about 15 hours a day, six days a week. The minimum employment age was just raised that very same year to 11, and the liberal reform of Britain that introduced modern attributes of the welfare state was 
14 years in the future. The first automobile was invented a mere five years before, so horses and carriages were still the primary means of transport. Electricity was but a 20-year-old novelty, and many were still confined to oil and candlelights. Furthermore, being a socialist anti-utopian story, please remember this story was written less than 50 years after Marx's communist manifesto. Lenin embraced revolutionary socialism a mere four years prior and won't publish his first Marxist essay for three years more. Stalin was still a pupil in the Orthodox Gory Church School, and it will take a quarter of a century further for the communist revolution in Russia to take place. In fact, how socialism itself will be instantiated within a state's framework was still an open question and cause for much debate in Jerome's time. In Britain, the British socialist organizations, the Fellowship of the New Life and the infamous Fabian Society, were but a seven-year-old fringe oddity of a few hundred weirdos, and the less than a thousand people strong Social Democratic Federation was of about the same age. Well, at least if you consider all the splitting, backstabbing, and quarreling you'd expect from communists. Socialists in Britain still believed that democracy, or rather true democracy, would be the governing system. And by true democracy, they meant the rule of the many and not the few. Or, in Marx's more Orwellian sounding term, the dictatorship of the proletariat. The idea of a socialist state descending into a kleptocratic tyranny would sound preposterous to mainstream British socialists at the time. Their vision was thoroughly different from Leninist Marxism, which, unbeknownst to them, would prove to be the future of socialism wherever it supplanted the previous system. In other words, Jerome K. Jerome is considering a less despotic type of socialism taking hold, with voter-based democracy as its key driver. This leads him to warn us against the dangers of majority-based rule, which populists, both on the left and right, should pay attention to. And with all that out of the way, and with no further ado, I present to you Jerome K. Jerome's The New Utopia as slightly rewritten by Humble Me. The New Utopia I had spent a fascinating evening with some very advanced friends at the Socialist Club. We had an extravagant dinner, and the 49 Chateau Lafayette was worth the price we had to pay for it, and there's not much more I can add in its favor. Later, over cigars, we had a very informative discussion. We talked of the coming equality of men and the nationalization of capital. Unfortunately, I could not join in the conversation since my background made me earn my own living since I was a child, so I never had the time to study these questions. Therefore, I listened attentively as my friends explained how, for thousands of centuries before they came, the world has been going all wrong, and how, in the next few years, they meant to put it right. Equality for all mankind was their catchphrase. Spoke of perfect equality in all things. Equality in possessions and position. Equality in influence and duties. Resulting in equality in happiness and fulfillment. 
The world, they said, belongs to all and must be equally divided. Work must not be used to increase one's own wealth, but used for the enrichment of humanity. Each man's labor should be the property of the state, which will feed and clothe him. Individual wealth, with which the few ruled the many, and the guns stolen by a small gang of criminals, must be taken from the hands that for too long have held it. Social distinctions, the barrier that restrained humanity's rising tide, must be swept aside forever. The human race must press onward to its destiny, not like now, each man for himself with unequal birth and fortune, but instead as an ordered army, marching side by side over the leveled playing field of equity and equality. Mother Earth should nourish all her children, none should be hungry, and none should have too much. The strong man should not grasp more than the weak, and the clever should not seize more than the simple. Nature's bounty belongs to all, and, as such, should be portioned in even measure. With inequality comes misery, crime, sin, selfishness, arrogance, and hypocrisy. But in a world where all men were equal, no temptation to evil would exist, and our natural nobility would assert itself. The world would be heaven, but, of course, free from the despotism of God. We raised our glasses and drank to equality, and then commanded the waiter to bring us more cigars. I did not go to sleep for a long while as I thought of this new vision of our world. Oh, how delightful life would be if the socialist scheme would be carried out. No more of this struggle against each other, no more jealousy and disappointment, and no more fear of poverty. The state would take charge and provide all our wants, from the cradle to the grave, and we won't need to give any of it a thought. Also, there would be no more hard work. According to our calculations, each adult citizen would not need to work more than three hours a day. In fact, people wouldn't be allowed to work more, especially me. There will be no poor to pity, and no rich to envy, no one to look down upon, and, pleasantly, no one to look down upon me. All our lives will be ordered and arranged for, and we will have nothing to think about except for the glorious destiny of humanity. Then my thoughts evaporated, and I fell asleep. When I woke up, I was surprised to find myself lying under a glass case inside a large gloomy hall. Above my head, I saw a label that ran as follows. This man was found asleep in a house in London after the Great Socialist Revolution of 1899. From the account given by the landlady, when he was found, he had already been sleeping for ten years. For scientific purposes, it was decided not to wake him up and see how much longer he would sleep. Accordingly, he was deposited in the Museum of Curiosities on February 11, 1900. Shifting my gaze, I saw an intelligent-looking old gentleman arranging stuffed lizards in another case nearby. He saw me awaken, came closer, took my cover off, and asked, What's the matter? Did anything disturb you? No, I said. I always wake up when I feel I've had enough sleep. 
and I promptly asked what century it was. It's the 29th century, he answered. You have slept for a thousand years. Pleased with my long, fulfilling rest, I got off the table and got dressed. After which, the old gentleman said, So, uh, I guess we're going to do the usual thing now? What do you mean? I asked. You know, he answered, I will walk you around the city and explain everything that has changed since you fell asleep, while you ask questions and make silly remarks. Yes, I replied. I suppose that's what we're supposed to do. I suppose so, he muttered. Come on then, let's get it over with, shall we? And he led the way out of the room. As we went downstairs, I asked, So, is it all okay now? Is what okay? he asked. The world, I said, and explained. You see, just before I went to bed, a few friends of mine were arranging to take the world into pieces and put it back again properly. So, have they got it fixed by this time? Is everyone equal now? And all that sin and sorrow and that sort of thing done away with? Oh, yes, replied my guide. You'll find everything is great now. We've been working pretty hard at things while you've been asleep. And we just got it about perfect now. It's great. Nobody is allowed to do anything wrong or silly. And there isn't a single unequal person amongst us. We walked out into the city. It was very clean and quiet. All the streets looked identical. They were designated by numbers and ran at perfect right angles to each other. There were also no horses or carriages, and traffic was conducted by electric cars alone. All the people around had grave expressions and looked so similar to each other, it was as if they were all members of the same family. Everyone, including my guide, was dressed in grey trousers and grey tunic buttoned tight around the neck with a belt around the waist. They were all clean-shaven, and they all had black hair. So I couldn't help but ask, Are all men twins now? Twins? Good gracious, no, answered my guide. What makes you say that? Well, I said, they all look identical, and they all have black hair. Oh, he said, that's the regulation color of hair. We all have black hair now, and those who don't have it naturally have to dye it to comply. Why? I asked. Why? retorted the old gentleman, somewhat irritated. I told you, everyone is equal now. What would become of our equality if someone was allowed to swagger about in blonde while another had to put up with being ginger. People must be equal now, and they must look like it. Makes sense, I said, but why black? That was the color they decided on, he said. Decided by who? I asked. By the majority, he replied, raising his hat and lowering his eyes as if in prayer. We walked further and passed more men, and I asked if there weren't any women in the city. Of course there are women here. We passed hundreds of them up till now. Now, I said, I thought I knew a woman when I saw one, but I can't remember noticing any. What do you mean? There are two right next to us, he said and drew my attention to a couple next by, dressed like all the rest in the grey trousers and tunics. I was somewhat surprised and asked, How do you know they are women? Well, he said, do you see the metal numbers that everybody wears on their collar? The even numbers are women and the odd numbers are men. 
How very simple, I remarked. I suppose after a little practice you can tell one sex from the other almost at a glance. Oh, yes, he replied, if that's what you want to do. Thinking of the numbers on their collars, I asked why they had numbers to begin with. To distinguish them by, he answered. Wait, I said, you mean you don't have names anymore? No, he said. Obviously, I asked why. Because there was too much inequality in names. Some people were called Montmorency, and they looked down on the Smiths, and the Smiths didn't like mixing with the Joneses. So, to save further bother, it was decided to abolish names altogether and to give everybody a number. Did the Montmorencys and Smythes object? I asked. Of course they did. But the Smiths and Joneses were in the majority. Wait, I said, but didn't numbers pose an issue too? Like ones and twos look down upon the threes and fours and so on? At first, yes, he said. But with the abolition of wealth, numbers lost their value. So now number 100 does not consider himself superior to number million, etc. At that point, I was beginning to feel somewhat hot and dirty. Can I wash myself anywhere? I asked. No he said. We're not allowed to wash ourselves. You must wait until half past four, and then you will be washed for tea. Be washed? I cried. By whom? By the state, he said. When I asked why, he explained that they found out they could not maintain their equality when people were allowed to wash themselves. Some people washed three or four times a day, while others never touched soap and water from one year's end to the next. Eventually, they had two distinct classes, the clean and the dirty. And just like that, all the old class prejudices began to be revived. The clean despised the dirty, and the dirty hated the clean. So, to end dissension, the state decided to do the washing itself. Private washing was prohibited, and now each citizen was washed twice a day by government-appointed officials. We continued our walk, and it dawned on me that we didn't pass any houses along the way. All I saw was block after block of huge barrack-like buildings, all of them the same size and shape. Occasionally, we did come across smaller buildings labeled museum, hospital, debating hall, bath, gymnasium, academy of science, exhibition of industries, school of talk, but never a house. Don't people live in this town? I asked. You do ask silly questions, he said. Where do you think they live? That's just what I've been wondering, I said. I don't see any houses anywhere. We don't need houses. We're socialistic now. We live together in fraternity and equality in these blocks. Each block has a thousand beds, a hundred in each room, with bathrooms and dressing rooms in proportion, and a dining hall and kitchens, too. At seven, they ring a bell, and we rise up and tidy our beds. Then, at 7.30, we go into the dressing rooms where we are washed, shaved, and have our hair done. Later, at eight o'clock, breakfast is served in the dining hall. We get a pint of oatmeal porridge and half a pint of warm milk. Oh, and we're all strict vegetarians now. Wait, I stopped him. You're all vegetarians? How? Oh, the vegetarian vote increased enormously during the last century. Their organization was so impeccable that they have been able to dictate every election for the past 50 years. Anyways, he continued, 
At one o'clock another bell rings, and everyone returns to a dinner of beans and stewed fruits. Twice a week we get roly-poly pudding, and on Saturdays plum duff. At five o'clock we have tea, and at ten the lights are put out and everybody goes to bed. We are all equal and live the same, together in fraternity and liberty. The men live in blocks on this side of town, and the women at the other end of the city. Then it occurred to me, if the men are on one side and women on the other, there's no place for married couples. So I asked him where they are kept. Oh, there are no married couples, he replied. How come? I asked. To which he answered at some length. We abolished marriage two hundred years ago. You see, married life did not work at all well with our system. Domestic life, we found, was thoroughly anti-socialistic in its tendencies. People thought more of their families than they did of the state. They wished to work for the benefit of their loved ones rather than the community. They cared more for their children's future than for the destiny of humanity. The ties of love and blood bound people together in little groups instead of one great whole. Before considering the advancements of humanity, people considered the advancement of their kin. Before striving for the greatest happiness of the greatest number of people, they strove for the happiness of those near and dear to them. Secretly, men and women deny themselves of goods, so as to put aside and give their beloved some extra gifts of joy. Love also gave rise to the vice of ambition. To win the smiles of the women they loved, men raised themselves above the general level. To leave a name that their children might be proud to bear, men tried to press a deeper footprint than their fellow men. The fundamental principles of socialism were being thwarted daily. Each house was a revolutionary center for the propagation of individualism and personality. From the warmth of each family grew up the vipers of friendship and independence to sting the state, and the doctrines of equality were openly disputed. When they loved a woman, Men thought her superior to every other woman and hardly took any pains to disguise their opinion. Loving wives believed their husbands to be wiser, braver, and better than all other men. Mothers laughed at the idea of their children being in no way superior to other children, and children dared mutter the hideous heresy that their parents were the best parents in the world. From whatever point you looked at it, the family stood forth as our foe. Wherever the family existed, there hovered the angels of joy and sorrow, and in a world where joy and sorrow exist, equality cannot live. One man had a charming wife and two sweet-tempered children while his neighbor was married to a she-devil with eleven ill-dispositioned brats. Where's the equality in that? On one side of the wall, a couple stood weeping beside a little cot, and on the other, another couple laughed at the silly antics of a graceful baby. What will poor equality do? Such things could not be allowed. Love, we saw, was our enemy at every turn. It made equality impossible. It brought joy and pain and peace and suffering. It disturbed men's beliefs and, thus, imperiled the destiny of humanity. And so, for the sake of equality, we abolished love and all its works. And it worked. We all live together now in equality, free from the troubles of love and heartache.
joy and pain. I paused before answering and said, But tell me, and know that I ask this only from a scientific standpoint, how do you keep up the supply of men and women? Oh, that's simple enough, he said, just like you did in your days with horses and cows. In the spring, the state decides how many children are required, and then they are bred under medical supervision. Once born, the children are taken from their mothers, in case she grew to love them, and brought up in public nurseries and schools until they are fourteen. Then, state-appointed inspectors examine them to decide their calling, and they are apprenticed accordingly until they are twenty, at which point they are allowed to vote, enjoying all the privileges of citizens. When I asked him what privileges he spoke of, he said, somewhat annoyed, Well, all the privileges I've been telling you about all this time. We kept on walking, and noticing nothing but huge blocks for miles on end, I asked, Are there no shops or stores here? No, he replied, the state caters for all our needs. What could we do with shops? It was then that I began to feel tired from our walk and asked, Can we go anywhere to have a drink? A drink? What drink? You mean the half pint of cocoa we get with dinner? Frustrated that he evidently would not understand me, I answered, Yes, I meant that. Later, we passed a fine-looking man with only one arm. I had already noticed by then other big-looking men who also had missing limbs, and it struck me as curious, so I remarked about it to my guide, and he explained. Yes, when a man is much above the average size and strength, we chop off one of his limbs to make things more equal. Nature, you see, is somewhat behind the times. Thinking about it, I asked, And what do you do to the exceptionally clever ones? Well, he said, we have not seen anything as dangerous as brain power for quite some time. But when we do, we perform a surgical operation to soften the brain down to the average level. And do you think it's right of you to cut these people up to tone them down like that? I asked. Of course it is right, he answered. It was agreed upon by the majority. How does that make it right? I asked. Well, the majority can do no wrong, he answered, to which I said, And is that what the people who are lopped off think? He was evidently astonished at the question. What does it matter? They are in the minority. Yes, I said, but even people in the minority have rights to their arms, legs, and heads, do they not? Of course not, he said. A minority has no right. Well, I said, I guess if you're thinking of living here, you better belong to the majority. Yes, he said. In fact, most people do. They seem to think it more convenient. We walked on, and I was beginning to find the town somewhat uninteresting. So I asked if we could go to the countryside for a change. My guide said we could, but didn't think I'd enjoy it much. Of course I would, I exclaimed. It is so beautiful there, the great green trees, the wind-waved meadows, the little rose-decked cottages, and... He stopped me mid-sentence and said, Oh, we've changed all that. 
There is no beauty in the country now whatsoever. We've abolished beauty. It interfered with our equality. After all, it is not fair that some people should live in lovely scenery and others in barren lands. So, we had to make it pretty much the same everywhere. And that way, no place will be nicer than another. What a pity, I thought, and went on to ask if people could emigrate to other countries. If they want to, sure, he said. But why would they? All countries are exactly the same. The whole world is one people now, one language, one law, and one life. I see, I said, and asked what they did for pleasure. Do you have any theatres, perhaps? Oh, no, responded my guide. We had to abolish theatres. Actors seemed utterly unable to accept the principles of equality. They all saw themselves as the best actor in the world and superior, in fact, to most other people altogether. Funny, I said. It was exactly the same in my time, but we took no notice of it. Ah, uh, well, we did, he replied. Also, there was the matter of the White Ribbon Vigilance Society. They claimed that all places of amusement were vicious and degrading, and being very energetic and loud, they soon won the majority. So all amusements are prohibited now. With no countryside or theatres or any type of amusement, I was wondering what happened to books. Are you allowed to read them? I asked. Well, he answered, there are not many written. You see, owing to our all living such perfect lives, and there being no wrong or sorrow or joy or hope or love or grief, and everything being so proper, there isn't much to write about, except, of course, the destiny of humanity. But what of the old works? I asked. The classics. You had Shakespeare, Scott, and Thackeray, and there were one or two little things of my own that were not half bad. What about all those? Oh, we burnt them, he said, and all the old paintings and sculptures, too. You see, he explained, they were full of all the wrong notions. Worse still, they made people think. So those who read grew smarter than those who did not. And since those who did not read were in the majority, they naturally objected. To me, it sounded rather bleak. So I changed the subject and asked what really interested me. How long do your citizens work each day? Three hours, he said, and after that, the rest of the day is ours. Fabulous, I said. With no books or art or theatres or countryside, what do you do in the other 21 hours? We rest, he said. Rest, I asked, for 21 hours? Well, he said. We also think and talk about things. Which things? I asked. He paused to think and said, We think of how wretched life must have been in the old times, and about how happy we are, and, and, oh, and the destiny of humanity. I see, I said unimpressed, and asked, How about religion? Do you have one? Oh, yes, he answered. I was intrigued and asked if it included worshipping a god, and he said it did. Which one? I asked, and without hesitating he said, the majority. Okay, I have one more question if you don't mind, I said. Ask away, he said. It's all part of my three hours work anyway. Good, I said, and asked. Do many people here commit suicide? No, he answered. Why would they? I looked at the faces of the men and women passing by. There was a 
patient, almost pathetic expression upon them all, and it suddenly dawned on me. I know that look. It's the same quiet, troubled, and wondering expression of the horses and oxen we used to breed in the old world. And then everything around me started to melt and evaporate. Faintly, I could hear the voice of my landlady, Mrs. Biggles, trying to wake me up. Has it all been a dream? Am I back in the 19th century? The sounds coming through the open window answered these questions quite persuasively. Outside, I could hear the rush and roar of old life's battle, men fighting, striving, and carving out each man his own life with the sword of strength and will, people laughing, grieving, loving, doing wrong deeds, doing great deeds, falling, struggling, helping one another, living. That was all nice until I realized what time it was knowing I had a good deal more than three hours of work to do. Oh, dear, I thought. Those cigars were way too strong. The End Now, if you stayed this far, I hope you will check the description to find ways to support my work, from buying books on Amazon to PayPaling me, or at least give a like and share. And with that, remember, don't do to others what is hurtful to you. Don't let the bad guys win, and thanks for staying to the end. See you in the next chapter.